to the men and women of our military. Along with America's first responder community, the firefighters, law enforcement officers, the EMTs, doctors, nurses, and their families. Life is about honor, duty, and above all else, selfless sacrifice. But for some of our service members, that sacrifice has come at a cost, a cost far greater than they should ever have to make. Whether it's an injury obtained in the line of duty or fallout from their experiences in the field, more often than not, this takes an incredible toll on both their bodies and their brains, leading to more than 20 military veterans and first responder suicides per day in America. As a country, we have to ask ourselves, are we doing enough to help those who've helped us? And can we do more? The Life Aid Research Institute has set out to answer just that. By focusing on peer support, coupled with a data-driven whole health approach and combining it with rigorous evidence-based research, they are challenging the status quo and testing the limits of integrative medical health treatments with an innovative new approach to technology and functional medicine treatments that focus on healing the source of the issue, brain injury, instead of simply treating the symptoms of mental health. LifeAid is inspiring an entire community to think about and approach this challenge in a new way before time runs out. There is no single solution on the long road to recovery for our service members. And the first step is always the most difficult. But today, we step forward. This is Life Aid, a story of hope. So I have all these relics just sitting here that have just sit here for years because he can't do it and I can't do it. So they just sit there, kind of like a reminder that those are the plans we had. We had a good life. We did everything together. And then, you know, things just change in, in an instant. I often say, and I've said this before, that I felt like we fell off the planet. I mean, everything stopped. Umberto always had a desire in his heart to give back to his community, and then decided to be a North Carolina State Highway Patrol officer, and he loved his job. On November 23rd, 2009, I had gone into work and I got a phone call saying that he had been in an accident. He was on the interstate and he was rear-ended at 75 miles an hour. The impact in the spin caused a severe traumatic brain injury. And the man that left that day did not come home. My name is Humberto Reina. I am a survivor of North Carolina State Highway Patrol. I had a hard time to all different stuff. And with this, my head, whatever it's doing there, I cannot get comfortable. It's just, I had to fight all the time. I don't know what happens anymore. That's not told me. What do you think about when you look at when you look at this guy smiling in that photo? I don't know. Somebody else, I guess. But it's not. It's you. Huh? It's you, though. I was. No anymore. The mindset of a person that joins the military has to be courageous and brave because you're putting your life in jeopardy for your country. My name is Edwin Williams, better known as Paco. I was ply in infantry. I think about it every day about Iraq and the stuff I've been through. Right after high school, I decided to go into the military. 
It was like a big start over and meeting new people. We was going on a mission and we dropped some people off. When my friend that was in front of me swerved and ran into an uh, explosive device. Just losing a friend that was always talking to me and keeping me in check to come home. So that, that, that was probably the hardest part. I lost probably about, I want to say, eight good friends over there. That was my family. And until I came back, I never thought about injuring myself. But I wanted, like, the, the flashbacks of what I did, I wanted it to be over. It's hard to differ from being a soldier and then a killer and then come back, and then everybody wants you to be human. I tried to be that old person, but I don't feel like I'm human no more. I went from being happy, loving, to always mad. Everything sets me off. Not able to look at certain things on TV, not to be able to play with my son a certain way. I didn't want to be around nobody. I was trying to block everything that I seen. When we get out, they don't give us no counseling. It's basically throwing us out to the wolves. We don't have that support that we need to help us get through that push. The military teaches you not to let your feelings out. It's like a secret to tell what you're dealing with. So the quick fix is, since nobody wants to hear it, I'm just going to end myself. I know I was injured doing my job, but nobody cares. No, even my neighbor, they have a patrol now. They throw me to the ditch, and I'm alone. Maybe one day I come out. What the misconception is, I think, across the country is that when a law enforcement officer is injured in the line of duty, they're going to get the best care possible, and they're going to be taken care of for the rest of their life, and that is not what happens. They get thrown into a workers' compensation system that cares nothing about them as a human being. I want to say he was only in the hospital for three days the first time, and they were just continually trying to throw him out. And he came home. He couldn't be in the room with anybody. He was sitting in the dark. He wasn't talking. He was moving extremely slow. You couldn't touch him. Our daughter, who was his lap child, could no longer even get near him. I knew something was terribly wrong with him. He was diagnosed with traumatic brain injury, cognitive deficits, PTSD, severe anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, complete personality change, super sensitive hearing, super sensitive smell. You hear on TV that they have non-life-threatening injuries. And yes, they are alive, but they're not the people that they used to be. And they have to rebuild new lives from the beginning. When a catastrophically injured officer lives in this country, there's no support to help them rebuild new lives. And then you have these family units that are dissolving because it's such a stressful time on the entire family. If we could get help, their lives could be better. What if he could have a day of peace? I mean, just a day of peace of mind. What would that do for him? I'm from New York City, New York, and I'm proud to be so. And I became a fireman because my mom was saved from a fire, so it's something I always wanted to do. It's the best job in the world to serve and to feel like you're giving back on a daily basis. I was working the morning of September 11. The planes struck the towers and we all queued up to go in and guys that you were talking to just an hour or so before didn't make it. Just amazing human beings that, you know, sacrificed their lives to rescue people. To lose people that you love and 
respect, you know, and know that their loved ones are suffering without them. It's, you know, you can imagine what it feels like. It's pretty overwhelming. You know, a lot of uh, survivor guilt. A couple of my colleagues were so distraught, they unfortunately decided not to go on, which was devastating to everybody. And then on a weekly basis, we continue to suffer losses from toxic exposure that occurred that day. We just lost another amazing guy last week to 9-11 uh, illness. So it just keeps on going. The doctors and scientists studied the aftermath of what we were exposed to and all of the carcinogens that were pulverized into like a very small powdery substance that was kind of super infused into everybody and in the air. For me, it was my lungs mostly. If I'm exposed to cigarette smoke or anything like that, I'll just, my lungs will start seizing. I'll, f I'll feel like I can't breathe. Behaviorally, you learn about post-traumatic stress from the doctors. It kind of helped explain a lot of the feelings that you go through. You break your arm, you put a cast on, but it's hard to see the internal injuries. The brain is incredibly complex. It's really an electrochemical organ that takes a lot of the blood flow in your body to function, and different kinds of injuries can affect that, that brain physiology, that structure and function. They have difficulty sleeping, they have pain, they have depression, and that does not allow them to function at their normal uh, capacity. A medical doc gives medicines. They're not always looking for root cause, they're treating the symptom. And one of the things we try to do here is treat the underlying cause of the symptoms. You know, the word heal is difficult to say, but really what we're doing is retraining the brain. Think of it as we're going down the highway and we're going 90 miles an hour because the brain wants to function and be as efficient as it can in its functioning. And all of a sudden you come up and a bridge is out. What's the first thing you do? You hit your GPS. GPS takes you out and around it, and you get to the other side, and boom, you're back to a 90. The second day, you come along, oh, I'll use my GPS again. You go out around it. After the third day, going to work, that bridge is still out. Now you know the, the back pattern that goes out and around it, and you do it. When we retrain the brain that the path is, is back open, now the brain is running efficient again, and all the side pattern that was going on as far as where the injury was could be causing the symptoms of PTSD, traumatic brain injury. Now we got the bridge open, and all of a sudden people are going, oh, my depression is better, my anxiety is better, and things of that nature. So we don't necessarily look at depression, we look at, okay, what do we gotta fix to get it working right? There is a lot of limitations in terms of what we can provide them in terms of medical therapy to deal with the kinds of dysfunctions that they're faced with. So that's where it's time to just open up the toolbox. My name is John Warden, and I started a suicide prevention program for first responders, military veterans, and their families to improve health and resilience using peer support, technology, functional medicine, and community activation to improve outcomes. Suicide has risen steadily every year in, in the top 10 leading causes of death. It's the number two cause of death for those between 15 and 25. And the reason that people lose hope is that they can't get past a barrier. There's just not an alternative program available that looks at the root causes of suicide, particularly with how brain injury affects mental and physical and emotional health of people. The first draw me into life aid was the love. For them to send me to California to get a brain scan, so I could prove to my doctor that I have a strong traumatic brain injury. They had some scans done of my brain and they pointed out exactly where it is and what it does. I actually did not sleep for days when I found out that we were gonna get to have the scans because that's not something we could get on our own. But to be able to actually see the scans was a validation. Because they look at me and say, oh, he doesn't have traumatic brain injury. The person that had traumatic brain injury has a scar on his head. 
whether it's trauma, toxic exposure, PTSD, all of these things can affect people in a different way. It's a little bit hard to study, a little bit hard to pinpoint. Every injury in the body can heal. So what we want to do is heal the brain and look at how do you do that using technology that doesn't exist yet or diet? It could be exercise. It could be things like CBD or cannabis. It could be hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Let's bring everything that is out there and let's just put it on the table and let's shine the light of rigorous scientific methodology to these interventions and see which ones work. We have this opportunity to do the hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which we would never have. That's not something we could ever get on our own. We come five days a week, Monday through Friday. And let's see, we got up at 4 a.m., left at 5, drove about an hour and a half to get here. And then we're here an hour, maybe an hour and 15, 20 minutes, and then an hour and a half back. I'm a professional driver, <laughs> for sure. I do a lot of miles. So put him in the chamber. Give him a chance to recover, get some benefit, yeah. When you give a patient hyperbaric oxygen, it allows oxygen to go to parts of the brain that are normally not oxygenated when they have this traumatic brain injury. A lot of what we know comes from these folks that are treating. It's subjective, but 90 to 100 percent of them within about 10 treatments will start to report an increase in clarity of thinking. They're sleeping much better. Consequently, those two things lend to much less depression. I did 40 treatments, and it really helped physically and mentally. When I first started, I was always in pain, uh, had a lot of headaches. Once I started doing it, my eyesight getting clearer, my breathing getting better, my bones getting stronger. If I have a migraine, probably it's like two minutes and it's gone. But I said to the doctors that when we finally got him back, I said, what are we gonna do with him for the rest of his life? I mean, basically, he was standing up against a wall. With 15 days of the hyperbaric therapy, he was sitting in the living room and he said, hey there. I just took a double take because he said, hey there. And I thought, wow, maybe it seems to be small. It's huge for the family. How do you show quantitatively, without question, how you can improve someone's brain health and how you, that correlates to physical, mental, emotional health and do it objectively so that all these traditional behavioral health people don't tell you that what you're doing is dumb. My first instinct is to be pretty skeptical. Um, my second instinct is to be open-minded because you don't know what you don't know. And I think that it's just as irrational to be skeptical for no reason as it is to be accepting for no good reason. Emotional stress is not tissue damage. So somebody who has had emotional trauma is not going to get better with hyperbarics. But our guys that have had repetitive head injuries, concussions from the time they were in high school, now we can do something. But people say they aren't reliable and things like that. But that's the only way we can show anything except individual patient testimonies and family testimonies. They start sleeping better. Some of them say, I'm dreaming for the first time in years since my head injury. When you see these guys actually improve, that's what made a believer out of me. For a while, I thought PTSD was just an idea, but it consumes you if you allow it. My name is Jose Miranda. Served the Navy for six years. Part of the reason why I enlisted was because of 9-11. My parents are immigrants, they came from Mexico. They gave us a life that they didn't have. So I felt like if I'm gonna be here, I'm gonna contribute to keeping the country safe. When I enlisted into the military, the first thing I wanted to do is be a SEAL sniper. I uh, qualified to go but I never went. I got injured in October 19 of 2004. I got run over by a jet on the flight deck of a carrier, and that's when literally you could say my dreams were crushed. So they took me to medical, they cut off my gear, they did what they needed to do, and they flew me to Balboa. And I wake up four days later, completely paralyzed from the waist down. By the time I had my final surgery, I ended up with a surgery count of 46 surgeries with three amputations. 
I got out and I went straight to work. So I didn't have that transition problem. And then two years after is when I, my PTSD finally like flared out to the fullest. PTSD, you kind of want to refuse sometimes that you have it just because you know what the aftermath is like. Like, no, that ain't gonna be me. Like, I'm still going to the gym, I'm still working out, I had a job, like, that's not me. It wasn't denial, but it's like, okay, if it, if I do have it, it's not as severe as, like, someone else's PTSD, you know? And when I lost the job, that's when the confidence went down, like, my self-esteem went down. I tried killing myself twice. One, uh, I, I chambered the round, I just couldn't pull the trigger. Uh, the other one is I took my um, a monk prescription of meds in two days. We're trained to adapt and overcome and, you know, defeat the enemy. You're not trained to understand depression. You're definitely not trained to allow yourself to be vulnerable, to feel hurt, to go request for help. We're not trained for that. Living with somebody that takes a lot of medication, it's kind of like living with an alcoholic. Like, he says things that he doesn't mean, but it's like he doesn't remember saying them. He was just a different Jose. He's had over 100 prescriptions in the past 10 plus years. It wasn't fixing him, it was making him worse. Most of the patients that we see that are in the military have been through extensive efforts at rehabilitation, they've been on various drugs, they've been through therapy, and all of these things have not gotten them where they need to be. I was taking about 12 different meds, and I knew if I kept feeling like a zombie, I wasn't going to make it. So I said I had to find something that was a lot better than what I'm doing. And then breathing deeply, belly, ribs, chest, allow the collarbones to expand wide. A lot of what we have considered to be the issues related to healing have been in the separation of self. Exhale all the way out. Begin to draw the navel in towards Yoga is simply breath and movement. The breath is the most important element of the human healing experience because of the connection between the physical body and the nervous system and this self-regulation component that happens. It has the most research and is now the largest prescribed modality. Anyone can do it and the contraindications are literally none. We're more than a body, and we're more than a soldier, more than a warrior, and breath and yoga offers, getting back to that human component. The breathing, the stretching, the way I feel after, no pain, no meds, my migraines don't last as long. It changed my depression completely. Mentally and physically, I felt I could control myself a lot better. We know that the work has been effective when they start rolling out the mat for someone else and they're staying after class and helping to support another veteran. I was looking for other alternatives other than medication and so I started researching. I came here, went through about two sessions of yoga, I met Paco. Knowing that there are other people like me, it just makes it that more comforting. So come on in here. So this is the float suite. Relaxation is not always easy, especially after a post-traumatic stress. Flotation, the zero gravity, actually activates parasympathetic nervous system for you, so it's an override. It's a thousand pounds of salt in 200 gallons of water. Everyone almost immediately goes to pain-free as soon as they are held in that weightlessness. I feel rejuvenated, feel relaxed, very relaxed. It almost feels like I can just let everything out and just kind of float there and just not have to worry about anything. The sensory overload that we experience is very taxing to the nervous system and it challenges all the functions of the body. 
One of the most commonly medicated problems that we have in the world today is sleep. And sleep is the precursor to all of this organic ability to heal. It helps with my sleep big time. I don't take any more medication. I mean, my kids are firsthand. They told me, they said, Dad, you've changed a lot just in the past six months. One of the issues that I have with talk therapy is the number of therapies and number of therapists and the subjective opinion of an individual. If you have a heart attack, do I ask you questions? No, we measure your heart. I'm just gonna measure your brain. We have a device called the Scorpion Chair. It looks like a gaming chair. And the person sits in it, the screen wraps around you, it, it has you know lights and it does all the modalities. What we're doing is taking science and technology and training it at a very accelerated pace without the subjectivity of the individual trying to guide it or the process or the procedure that's getting it there. We're letting the brain heal itself. It works primarily on the default mode network. It takes the amygdala and brings it back to a lower level so your fear factors and things are being pushed into long-term memory. So you deal with your crisis. On average, you see the changes starting at 10 sessions. On that laptop right now is one of our brain tuners is logging into the system and actually looking at Sebi's brain live. So what we're gonna do is impedance match the sensors to what is going on with Sebi, so then we can conduct neurofeedback training after that. What we do is you think of it like when you're studying for a test and you're cramming, your brain is just saturated and you're, you know, you hit that point. What we do is we try to push the brain almost to that. So some people react where they're, that's, they're heightened. They're like, Phew. other people are like, oh my God, I just studied for 15 hours, you know, and they're, they're exhausted. The brain starts searching, so what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I, I don't like the screen shrinking. And then all of a sudden it hits it and the software tells it, okay, Phew, put the screen back up. Then it goes back down and then the brain gets it and goes, oh, that's what you want me to do and Phew, forces it up. We're basically creating a workout program for the brain. All right, so, so here's your real-time brain waves. Now, can I have you blink a few times in succession for me? Yes. Okay, that looks good. We can actually see concussive events or PTSD by pattern recognition that can go back 40 years, and we can see it. And then we can also put a protocol together that can help them. With SEBI, what we did is a combination of multiple modalities and we're seeing a significant difference in his pattern recognition and his memory. I've seen a difference in myself, most importantly my children, I've seen this difference in me. To go from a state of treating symptoms instead of a cause and feeling a little bit hopeless to a place where, you know what, I'm gonna be proactive and I'm gonna try and rectify it a little bit. I owe it to myself and to people around me to do that. Gold medal. This is seniors. Seniors golf. The, the senior games. This, this year? Mm -hmm. Swimming. Veterans have figured out that adaptive sports is very therapeutic. But law enforcement had discovered there was nothing in the country for them, so his doctors had to prescribe his care. And so they have actually prescribed adaptive sports for him. My injury in my head, it just, it's just all over. So when I go golf, that give me from one minute to another one. Just give me a little break. And same, same when I'm running, I bring my way of thinking to, to actually what I do and run and go off. And I do as much as I can. He has a lot of injury but you have to rebuild on what you have left. And so what he had left was his athletic ability. I still have a hard time to be around, but when I go to the road and a bike, it's changed. The sports is very therapeutic, and when I ride, it's just me and the bike. At the time he was injured, we'd been married 20 years. He comes home and we can't even touch him. Four and a half years later, after three days of riding, he put his arm around my shoulder, and I said, this is it. 
this is it. You know, I can't tell you, I just, how exciting that was because he's in there. He's in there somewhere. This is all we do. <laughs> so we do the wine, we golf, and we, uh, he has his bike that he rides here at home. And I will just say this, my husband was a long way gone. He was a long way gone when he came home from that accident. And it's been a long way to get him back. And it's just been baby steps the whole way with persistence. Here we are 10 and a half years later, and he's, you know, doing a lot of things that he couldn't do before. It's been 10 years, and I'm still trying to get back on the planet. As a country, we have enough resources that we can help the injured, and we really do need the support. Humberto's had a tough time, and they were searching for answers, and the idea that he thought that cycling could help him, and then just watch year after year how much different he becomes. It's been six months, maybe, since I last saw him, and we were out in the trails today, and he's like, hey, John, can we fix my back wheel? It's like sliding all over the place. And I went up to Ken and go, he's initiating conversations. He's never done that before. Now that we're able to adapt and provide to them the technology with the hyperbaric therapy and the brain mapping, so now you see that smile because he's healthier and he's happier. These services are allowing us to have new hope, new tools, new ways to beat this because I know my husband. If anybody could come back from injury, he could. But if we don't have the resources, we don't have any hope of doing it. But with help, we can. Particularly when it comes to first responders and military, we're fix-it kind of people. And so when we see something wrong, we, we dash in there with our superpowers and, and we try to fix it. And we think with our own personal strength, we can really make that happen. Sooner or later, we discover that only goes so far. He was just spiritually not there, angry at God, angry at anything. What faith does is drag us out of ourselves and our own thoughts that we can do it all on our own to something that's bigger than ourselves. That's one of the reasons why we joined the way we did. We realized there was more to what we can do than just us as individuals. Well, the same is true with life. The point of faith is really to look inward and say, what makes life important to me? Who makes life important to me? And who is alongside me to help me write my story? It gives us a reason to keep going, and that's hope. That whole idea of finding hope and purpose together is really what we do. The exciting thing about Life Aid is that John has put his finger on this idea that we need a community, we need to be able to support each other, we were having breakfast one day, and I was like, I think I want to go to church. And then we started going, and that's where the healing really happened. As we can scale and be able to get our hope communities built, we can service hundreds of thousands of people. You start creating that network. As we build each other up, and we continue to throw these little lifelines out to people, you can move forward. Seeing Jose being Jose, I spent so much time in life being angry at God versus redirecting my question in the form of why am I still here? What use do you have for me? And then that's when I was introduced to hand cycling. Within four or five, six months, I do my first challenge ride from Chicago to Detroit. And that's when I met John. When I started getting involved, it gave me a confidence that like two legs aren't required to live life. I think any effort that builds up the whole person is worth getting behind. John is taking this from a holistic perspective. It isn't just a matter of getting somebody on a bicycle and, and telling them, look, there are no limitations. It's, it's more than that. We need a community. We need to be able to support each other. We need a, a purpose. We need meaning. 
Uh, all of those things are integral to his understanding of the whole person. The group cycling part by far is the thing that brings the group together the best. It changes the dynamic of the group. From yesterday to today, there'll be a transformation, and it's because of what we're about to do. Find a bike. Oh, that's Find a bike. We're out here supporting each other and just taking care of one another, riding our bikes. If you have a group of people who are complete strangers for the most part, who are gonna be now brought together and put into an environment that is unnatural for them previously. A lot of times you'll share stuff with your friends that you don't share with your family. Your spouse and your kids, you wanna shelter them from that real world experience. But by keeping it inside, it eats you alive. You need to be able to talk about it, but you need to be able to talk to somebody that understands it, but won't be adversely affected by it. We're gonna get a big group picture before we start. And so peer support, at the essence, that's what we are. When I met John in life, he didn't want to talk to nobody. And he was like, I want you to speak on your problem tonight at dinner. I never told nobody my story. My wife, nobody knew about my story. So I thought about it, I said, you know what, I'm gonna tell it. And after that, I told my story, it felt like a release. That was the first time I had cried in a long time and everything came out. So I knew right then this was the right place to be with life aid. Of all the folks that we tested, he was probably the most at risk for suicide. So we were able to create an alternative therapy plan for him. We implemented it and it saw immediate results. So much to the fact that a couple Fridays ago, he told the group, suicide is no longer an option for me. The suicide rate has gone up for 12 years. What you're doing isn't working. Doing more of it isn't going to help. We really need to start over again. And massive bureaucracies set themselves up to limit change. One of our patients needed a scan done. And unfortunately, what we ran up into is bureaucracy. And oftentimes, that's prohibitive to getting the care. They're not eager to go ahead and pay for a treatment if they don't have proof of its efficacy. We need to convince our providers that this is something that could work. And that's why our program is so important and why it's so successful is because we can turn on a dime and look at things and, and immediately go, if it's not working, change. If Paco hyperbaric therapy wasn't working, I'd say, stop doing that and let's do something else. As a physician, I kind of feel a little bit desperate that, you know, here that we have this large population of people who are suffering and we really have a limited repertoire of what we can provide them to help them in their everyday lives. There's a lot of issues with fundraising and the cost of doing this research. So let's get other people involved. Let's bring in people like John. Let's bring in inventors who have new technology to put on the table. Let's be rigorous and let's apply valid scientific methods to try to understand how these interventions can help our active duty military. I just want to see less people dying for supporting their country, their state, their city and for people to help us and to just be a community. When you're in the military, the only thing that matters is who's on your right and who's on your left. And that's your purpose, is protecting your buddies. You start to lose hope because you don't have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. And so the purpose can be, hey, there's a life aid retreat coming up, so I want to do that. Humberto's purpose is I wake up at 5 a.m. because I'm going to drive to the clinic to take hyperbaric therapy because it makes me feel good and I'm improving and it improves my relationship with my wife and it takes a burden off of her. It's just exponentially good. We're all enthusiastic about these research trials, but we want to proceed in a very careful and cautious way so that we understand whether or not it truly has a long-lasting effect on our patient. That's what we try to do every day. So many people are suicidal, they have no hope. If you can give them one ounce of hope, then it's magic. I do believe that Life Aid is taking people and making them stronger. Isn't that part of what we do as military or first responders anyway? If somebody goes in first, then there's somebody who's got his back, and then there's somebody who's got that back. We're designed to hold each other up wherever we are in that moment. I can discuss my struggles with them, and they don't judge me. We're family. 
If you could get people not to feel alone, I think that helps. Kay and Umberto and I, we've just stuck together. They supported me so much during my time. We wouldn't know each other if it wasn't for this organization. It gives you support that you don't have otherwise. Before, I didn't think I had a purpose. Find things like life aid to keep going. This isn't only about the soldiers. It's not only about the first responders. It's about the families. Because if we're not well, they won't be well. There's a lot of suicide in the country. We cannot continue to yell at the drowning people to save themselves. They can't do it. We need to support them and give them everything they need to rebuild a new life after injury. And we cannot do this alone. We have to have your support. We cannot do it alone. It's a slippery slope when you fall into despair. Find something that works that can help you draw out of that. The hope kind of stabilizes everything. It enables other people to grow and, and to become stronger and to be encouraged and to find hope. No one else is taking the time to help in a very tailored, specific way. John's going to work his magic. He's not going to say no. Don't give up. Keep going. Keep searching. You deserve it because you're worth more than you know. Don't turn your back on us because we're here. Text HOPE to 844-902-2022 to donate now.